Thanks for joining us for the Long Island Sound Podcast. Each week we explore new music and dive deeper with the artists and their stories behind the music. Please subscribe and rate and review us wherever you stream this podcast. Here's your host, Steve Yusko. You're going to be so happy that you tuned in today. We had such a great time meeting Walter Finley and his partner, April Dawn. They make beautiful music together. You couldn't find two people who are polar opposites, two sides of the same coin. They have a fantastic backstory on how they met and the songs that they produce are absolutely wonderful. Let's take a listen to Big Star in the Sky. Walter Finley is a multi-award-winning singer-songwriter and performer from North Carolina who originally hails from Long Island. He's been touring about with his partner, April Dawn, and they just won Tour of the Year at the Carolina Country Music Awards, among many other awards that we'll get to talk about. This American troubadour is an artist worth looking into. And with that, I welcome Walter Finley and April Dawn to the Long Island Sound podcast. So great to have you guys here. Thank it's, you. Thank you, Steve. It's great to be here. What I like about what I do, because I like talking about myself, 
is discovering new music and listening to the songs that you gave to me. There's just something about your voice and the baritone that fills it and the harmonies you guys do. It's just, it's really kind of something to behold, to be honest with you. I really, I really enjoyed your music. Thank you, Steve. Yeah. We got to chat a few days ago about uh, you, you starting out on Long Island. And then if I recall, you, uh, Walter, you moved down to uh, Columbia, South Carolina, correct? Yes. So t- tell me about that musical journey of, of the move from New York and the hiatus and the exodus, which a lot of my friends are doing as well, uh, down south, and, and how that affected your art and your music. Yeah, okay, sure. Uh, well, first of all, Long Island is where I spent pretty much all my life. Um, I was born and, and spent most of my life there. And um, I was born in Huntington, lived in uh, East Northport, Comac area uh, when I was young. Mm-hmm. And then I uh, moved to... Uh, the South Shore for a little while, and then I lived in West Hampton Beach for about 20 years. Um, wow, nice. Yeah, it's been cool. I went to Five Towns College where I met one of my best friends, my friend Steve Messina, and um, we journeyed out to the Hamptons to start playing music in 1985, 86, 87, around there. Okay. And we uh, we did really well, you know, I, uh, the two of us did well, and we did our own things, and and I ended up making a, somewhat of a career out of that. I would play every night of the week, you know. So we had the Hamptons. Uh, well, at one point, I was a house musician at the Montauk Yacht Club. And as years went on, I became a house guy at BB King's in Times Square for, for a little while. So, you know, we just, that island in New York and upstate, and it was a lot of places to make music and play, and a lot of, uh, a lot of great uh, memories. But uh, I never really dove into or got broke into the industry, right? I just did my own thing. I was a a troubadour through and through. I was just, I just love to play. For me, playing is just releasing my my inner self or, uh, you know, music has a purpose in my life, right? You know. Right, sure. I've I've written very uh, heartfelt healing songs because I needed them, you know? Or if I might write something very sweet and beautiful because I'm a little too hyperactive and I need it to calm down, right? Or explore those emotions and thoughts. I was able to bring my emotions out and see what's going on inside. That's why I, I, mm. I originally was writing. You brought up a good term, and I read it in your bio, about being a troubadour. Mm-hmm. And what I liked about your story is, and I've talked to a lot of singer-songwriters who you know, are in that constant struggle as they're starting out to get gigs. Right. And your method as a troubadour is you go out with your guitar, I assume you walk into a place and say, I'd like to play music for you. And you play music for them right then and there. So they get to experience who you are, which I think is phenomenal. Gutsy. That's exactly how Steve and I got our first um, beach bar gig together. It was called the Beach Bar in Hampton Bays. And we walked in, sat on bar stools. Oh, I know it. Yeah. Yep. And we sat on these bar stools. And we got the owner in front of us, and we just started jamming in front of him. And we got every Saturday. And that's how that one thing started. But originally, it was a guy named Larry Hoffman uh, brought me to... Um, he, he had a place in Quag called Dockers. Uh, he had another place up in okay. Oakdale. He brought me there first, and I played there for a while. And then one day, he came up to me, and he said, This summer, I'm bringing you to the Hamptons. And he put me in Dockers, which was a really cool place to play. Uh, an amazing experience and from there we just just that's where we went to play and then we uh, at the same time we were doing uh, we play every Wednesday night at at Turtle Bay on 2nd and 52nd uh, in Manhattan Mm. and then Steve had gotten this gig in Prohibition on Tuesday nights I get to go to do that and then from there I started playing down in the West Village a lot and just so that's what we did we we took I took the train subways and uh, I did that every night. We found places to play. You know, you know what's interesting about Long Island? For people who don't know, it's, it's kind of segmented out. I mean, there are uh, people from the North Shore, the South Shore, and the East End, and then Queens and Brooklyn, you know, which we consider part of Long Island geographically. But if anyone says, hey, I'm going to the city, you're either going to Queens, Brooklyn, or Manhattan, you know, maybe the Bronx and never to Staten Island because it's a bridge too far. But... 
it's interesting that you were pulled out to the East End, and there's a certain community of singer songwriters out in the East End. Uh, there's a guy named Gene Casey, oh. who I'm actually going to see tonight. He's amazing. I love uh, his and band. Nancy Atlas. Nancy, Nancy yeah. And interesting. I went to school with I went to school with Nancy's brother in like high school. Oh really? really? Like we were friendly. He was a great guy. I never saw him again. But that's that's my connection to Nancy Atlas. I guess you know that's about as far as it goes. Well, I'll make mention as I get because I'm trying to uh, to get Nancy, uh, who's a phenomenal singer, uh, on the program. But hey, I don't want to ignore the beautiful lady that's sitting next to you, uh, April Dawn. And April, is that your really is that your real name, April Dawn? It is. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. <laughs> So tell me how you roped in this Yankee from New York and you began singing together. Um, I'm very curious about that. Well, I have to be honest. When Walter and I met, we didn't like each other at all. I wouldn't go that far. I, I didn't like his accent. He talked entirely too fast and I couldn't understand anything he said. And he felt the same way about me with my country accent. So it, it took some time and, you know, it... Um, it's such a different lifestyle. You can't get any more opposite than us. He grew up with a pool in his backyard. Sure. I grew up with a creek in my backyard. So it took time. It's like I tell mm. everybody he chased me till I caught him. <laughs> now, you, if I recall, you were you were a photographer at that point, and I think uh, you were, you kept on asking him to play certain songs that he didn't know how to play. Yeah, um, we were. And I think yeah. So take it from there. It, it was a setup. Um, a friend of our, a mutual friend of ours was having a party and she invited me to come take pictures. And I actually went with an ex-boyfriend to take pictures because he was a photographer as well. And, um, mm -hmm. so Walter's on stage and he's singing songs that he knew and everything. And I looked at the audience and they were all older Southern people. And I kept thinking about growing up down here, being a Southerner and thinking, you know, what songs would they like to hear? What would be familiar to them? What's something they could sing along to? Sure. So I requested a couple and Walter didn't know them until finally on the third try, he was like, well, I don't know that one. It's a really great song. Do you? And I said, yes, I do. Do you like exactly for me? <laughs> and he said, would you like to play? And I said, well, I can if you want me to. So he handed me his guitar, and three or four songs later, I'm like, "Hey, do you want this thing back or what?" Well, it was a it was a <laughs> thing I did because I, I learned somewhere along the way that there's nothing better than letting somebody come up and take the spotlight at a party or a wedding or anything like that, and let them sing. And so when they play, I'm usually like, "All right, you have to do three songs," and then after they get to three, I'm like. You have to do seven songs. And it's a joke, you know, it's like, <laughs> I'm getting paid to, to watch you play. But that's a memory people have for a lifetime, that they got up and they got to sing. And, you know, what I do every day, every day people don't get old, always get to do. So when they have an opportunity, you know, music, uh, performing, it's about sharing. So if you, especially young people, if you can right. support the young people, get up there and, and, you know, when they're nervous and they, they do it. They never forget that. That's a, a beautiful thing to do. And that's kind of what I was doing with her. I'm like, play another one. Play another one. Yeah, I agree with you 100%. When, you know, it, it, as I've listened, and, and Debbie, my wife, and I, when we go out, we always look for live music, is I see that divide between what I, you know, very good performers, and then what I would say is crossing over to be an entertainer and to engage and be in the moment or be present to your audience. And April, you pull that out. You recognize that, hey... The audience may not be connecting with Walter at that particular moment because there was something that was not familiar I don't think that was to happening. I was totally connected to everybody. I don't know. Yeah. I, I spoke to April. She said you was you were sinking pretty fast, sinking. and she saved no. you. Oh no! <laughs> I was. Just That's not the way I saw it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, actually, if you go to our Facebooks, you can see video on my Facebook of the first time I ever played his Breed Love guitar. It's up. It's that day that we met. Wow. It's now, on there. it's really. Now, it's funny you mentioned because you're an artist, Walter, for Breed Love, right? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I am. So, if you look right behind I saw me, it. I saw it. That's soon. my Breed Love. <laughs> I know. As soon as you signed on, I'm like, that's my it's Breed Love. That's my Breed Love guitar. I love it. I love it. I got it in a, uh, a music shop in Saratoga when I was looking for something different and this guy said, Hey, there was some guys from Taylor's who started breed love and, and I think you'll really like it. And I fell in love with it. It's just, I love guitar. restringing it real fast. 
I love being able to restring it real fast <laughs> on the spot. No pegs. Right, right. Hey, so let's do this. Let's just take a, a quick break. And when we come back, I want to talk about that first song that our audience heard, uh, Big Star in the Sky, and uh, just give us some, uh, some aspects of how that song came about. So we'll be right back after this short break. Hang with us, everybody. At the Long Island Sound, we're much more than a podcast. We're building a community. Please go to gigdestiny.com. Check out all our social media links. Subscribe wherever you listen to the podcast. Please comment. Call the listener line. Tell us what you think, what questions we should ask, who we should have on the show. And most of all, we thank you for your generous support. And remember, support the artists who are guests on the show. Now hey back everybody. to the podcast. Steve Yusko, your host with the Long Island Sound. We're back with Walter Finley and April Dawn having a great conversation. And before the break, Walter... Um, we spoke about Big Star in the Sky, the song that our audience heard before we started the podcast. Tell me a little bit about how that came about. For me personally, right? Personally, of course, the songs had meaning for me. Uh, and there's a message in there for myself. Mm -hmm. But I was really thinking about... Uh, there's There are people in my life that I, I was witnessing and seeing... Uh, not so much for younger folks, but for people who are a little bit older and they were looking at me doing what I was doing, mm -hmm. you know, because my whole life I was told, you know, you're just too old. By the time I was 29, record companies were like, we love what you do, but you're just too old for us. Wow. I, I literally. And, and that, and, and I, I often reflect back and like, then why did I keep going? Because I love music. I love to play. And, and there, there's nobody that can stop me from playing and, and, and performing. It's, you know. Mm -hmm. Just because I'm not on uh, The Voice, uh, winning The Voice or getting noticed doesn't mean I suck, right? <laughs> and right, right. That was the shame of that show. I was like, people judge people for singing. And singing is not something to be judged. It's uh, the voice, for me, singing is the voice of my heart. How do you judge the voice of my heart? You can't. Right. 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 So I would see these people and they're like, they have dreams. And they had they things that they wanted to do. And I saw it so much and, and they kind of try it but they just don't think they can do it they just don't believe or because of the societal um they're afraid uh, of being judged uh, the societal mm. rules that they think the rules so big star in the sky is literally i'm saying you know you had a dream you planned to try you know and you're afraid it's too late and you, you sit there and you cry that you didn't follow your dream. So I'm saying, go for it, man. <laughs> go for it. Write your songs. Sing your songs. Find a place. There's a place for you. You know? And an interesting thing about that song is it was probably one of the first tools I used to grab Miss April into my life was that song. That was <laughs> so I was not writing there. It, it was I not sent there it to at her, all. Right? <laughs> but she was struggling. She was having such a struggle. And in the middle of the night, I sent it to her on the phone. And mm -hmm. she never said anything to me until years later. She goes, you know, I listened to that song and I cried and I listened to it. And you've really got me with that song. I never knew until we were together for a few years. Right. So let me, you know, you bring up a good subject. I remember listening to an interview with David Grohl from the Food F Foo Fighters, oh, who really lament, guy. yeah, he's great, and he lamented the tragedy of America's Got Talent and all these shows that will take a person, and I think this is horrible to be honest with you, and reform them over the weeks. You know, throw new clothes on them, and and you know, I can understand it, um, but it it also makes people try to form themselves into something they're not. You know, and being true to yourself and your art and exposing yourself and continuing with that is really something to be ad admired in what we do. I, I think it's like this, mm -hmm. honestly. Um, normal will never be extraordinary. Mm. Ooh, there's a song in that. <laughs> yeah, she's got some good stuff. We'll be coming out with uh, songs from April. Uh, I think before the year's end. We'll have some extraordinary songs from April, and I, I plan on it. We've already oh, that's started great. recording some stuff. Yeah. But I think that, um, you know, songwriting and, and music and going for your dreams. And I just want to back up. I also have a niece, um, Samantha, who is just an amazing singer. Wow. So I had her in mind while I was writing she that is. song, too. Um, what's what's her name? What's her full name? Ne Samantha? She goes under Samantha Joe, I think. And okay. she's uh, doing Christ Christian music right now. And she's singing with a band called 
pursuing JC, and they're amazing. These kids are amazing. Oh, the antidote to the song is, I wish you could see what a big star you are to me. You know, mm -hmm. it, the most important things in our lives, right, are our loved ones. There's nobody more important. If your family and who you're with, you're already a star. Everybody is. I think John Lennon said, Every, right, you are, everybody's. It's true. Right. That's what's really important. So when your dreams don't come true, you better step back and look at what you really have. And, you know, and where you really are. And Big Star in the Sky kind of mentions that. I wish you could see. Yeah. And also, there's nothing more beautifully amazing than someone who is actually doing something that they love mm -hmm. to do with their whole heart. If they're very passionate about something and they're, they're doing it despite everything else, then that's the most beautiful thing on earth is, is when you keep getting back up. I think art is something that, uh, like for me, I'd love to using my hands, whether it's working with wood, right. cooking, uh, painting. Mm -hmm. uh, I just love using my hands. So, But when you cook, like I lived alone for many years and I would write. And like I'd have a studio set up in the living room and the kitchen right over there. And I'd record some tracks mm -hmm. and play them through all the speakers and go in the kitchen and start cooking and listening to my own music. And say, oh, oh, nice. I should change this. Oh, and... And, but it kept me busy. When I lived alone, you know, having a fireplace and cooking food takes up time and it's satisfying. It's just something I did with my hands or building something. Right. And then you get to step back and look at what you built. You get to sit back and eat what you just cooked. You get to listen to the music you just made. And it's, it's art you were creating. Yeah. You know, what, you know what's interesting? I've, I find this particularly with guys, and I can re reflect on myself, is I like to work with my hands as well. And is that satisfaction of, I did that, you know, uh, for, for whatever, you know, 190%, I did that, you know, uh, and I can point to something. And it's that creative urge that I, I think we all have uh, to create and to express ourselves is really important. I want to ask you a question, though. In looking at your career and your tenacity, I'll say, in keeping doing what you do, Obviously, there's struggles, you know, making ends meet, you know, taking the trip down south to hone your craft and what have you. What would your advice be to um, a new singer-songwriter getting out? What would your, you know, what would you say to them if you had them in the room with you right now? Right, 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 right. And per perform in front of people as much as you can. Um, mm -hmm. I, there's something about performing in front of people. You know, I'll, I have this habit of, I need to learn a new song. And I will listen to it in the morning, kind of get a feel for it. I'll be playing mm -hmm. it that night. And I'll play it at the beginning of the night, the end of the night, and I'll do it every night. And I'll never listen to it again. <laughs> okay. I'll just start playing it. And the first time I play it, I know I'm going to mess it up. I've come to a point sure. to be allowed to make mistakes and not let it go. Oh, my God, I did this. I'm, who cares? But... My advice to a, a musician doing that is make sure you end it really good. Okay. So people know when to clap. <laughs> so you end it good. Um, now, if you, before you backed up, you said, you know, you went into bars and actually got the gigs. Well, yeah, that's what I did. But I also found a way to negotiate with bar owners that seemed to work. I mean, how does a guy walk in and work eight days a week, years straight, right? Mm -hmm. You negotiate. Uh, one technique I used, I'd walk in and say, what's the slowest night of your week? Okay. Oh, uh, Monday, Monday night. Okay. I'll work at half price for three weeks to build an audience. And if I build an audience, then you gradually bring me up to full pay. That sounds fair. Let's do it. And at wow. the end of that three, four, maybe four weeks, you say, yeah, it's still kind of even, but I'm still making some money and I mm -hmm. like doing it. Then you could stay there. You're working every Monday night. So if you're making 150 bucks every Monday night, that's six hundred dollars a month, right? That's right. seventy-two hundred dollars a year you just made on a Monday night. Right. Is that right? Did I do the math right? Right. No, now I you don't times know. that. I'm, I'm horrible seven. at math. <laughs> you times but that you know by what? seven and it goes up for the weekend, you're making a good career just playing in restaurants and bars. If you Yeah, if but you, you know what you, right. you you do when you do that, Walter, is you recognize that the establishment owner needs needs you to help build an audience and help 
to to move product and what have you. And you're you're partnering with them at that point and saying, hey, I understand That's right. what you need to do. And you don't want to just shell out X and not see a return. So guess what? I'll take I'll take some responsibility and let's see what we can do together. And you just right. lowered the bar for him to or her to allow you to come into their venue. And then who knows where it goes. Yeah, from because there. I would walk into strange towns. You know, if you're living in West Hampton Beach or Northport or Comac and you go into um, you know New anyway. Queens or yep. somewhere from, and you don't, well, do you have a following? No, but I'll build one for you. And the uh, and that that's just that one side of it is of playing those kind of venues. Then you have to remember what is your job? What is my job for playing for these people? My job is to sell another beer. <laughs> True. Right. Yep. That's what your job is. It's not a concert. That's a whole nother aspect to get into. Right. Now that's a whole nother game. But if you know so part of my my what I would tell my uh, restauranteur is, well, I know I can get somebody to stick around after they eat and buy another drink. Mm. And if I get 20 people to do that, I just paid for myself. And they understand that. That's what they want to do. They want to sell another drink. They want to make money off of having you there. They don't want to spend money. They don't right. need to spend money and lose money on you. They want to make money with their artist. So, and, and that's how I had to do it. And I know what my... My my vibe is in a bar. I know where I belong. I don't belong in a rowdy rock and roll bar. That's not mm. going to work. I need right. a three star, four star restaurant. I'll do really well, or mm -hmm. something where the clientele is a certain echelon that um, fits with the sound that I'm making. Right, right. That's, you know, That's... so you got to know where you belong, and what you can do for that. What you can offer. Now, as far as um, uh, going in another direction to do shows and writing in music. I think you should write, write, write. I think you should go, if you've never done this before, go to uh, write arounds and meet mm -hmm. other writers. Uh, go to open mics. And and if you don't feel like you belong there, try to practice and get better until you can get to the level where you are. And you'll talk to people and people will guide you. Go to where you know things are happening. You have to be in the milieu of things, right? Um, sure. I had a... a a vocal teacher whose son was a very prominent guitar player, pretty famous. Mm -hmm. And he would say this. He goes, you need to be in the milieu of things, Walter. And like, my son got a job at SIR Studios. And that's where he worked. Wow. And he got to play for very famous people. And he got into the right... You, so you go to Manhattan, right? If you want to play music, you live in New York. Go to Manhattan. Go to the places where you're going to get heard. And, right. and pay your dues, especially if you're young enough to do it. Right, and exactly. the cost is big. Yeah, it'll cost you a normal life. You can't have a normal life if you're going to do this. You, we're always running. I am so blessed to have a partner that is willing to stand by me everywhere I go, everywhere. Mm. Right, he never complains. We travel so good together. Right, we can get in the car and hold hands and drive and drive and drive and talk about new places and go new places. And it's somebody asked us in another podcast, "What's your favorite part?" And I said, "Performing." But sure. I thought about it. I'm like, the other favorite part is driving with April. We, oh, that's you know, great. We, drive, we have to go from here to Virginia to New York, and we drove to Wisconsin last year, Chicago. It was, it was wonderful. It was beautiful. Seeing the countrysides, meeting new people, performing. It's, it's, yeah. It's, that's great. It's wonderful. Hey, let's do this. Let's talk about the other songs that you brought on. This is going to come out in March. Uh, when you're going to have your, your new release, and I really thank you for bringing these to the table. Talk about Lean To, and then we're going to let our audience have a listen to it. Uh, I love Lean To, and it's funny. I just said we love traveling and looking right. at countryside, and I would see these farms, and I'd see these barns, and I, we're driving one time. You know, she grew up on a farm. She was a farmer her whole life. Mm -hmm. And I go, I love those barns. I love the way that looks. She goes, those are called lean-tos. I'm like, oh, I didn't know that. You know, mm -hmm. everybody in the world knows those are called <laughs> lean-tos, the lean-to. So we come home, we're on a stay home. I said, I'm writing a song about a lean-to. And April goes, Nobody's ever written Nobody's a song, ever written about, a song about a lean-to. Lean I think you got something there. <laughs> well, no, you didn't say you got something there. The first time you said it, it was sounded like, <laughs> you're, wasting, you're wasting your time. That's stupid. Right, right. But I stood up there and I wrote it. But that's the way I took it. Doesn't mean she meant it that way. That's just the way I felt. But right. I came downstairs after uh, writing some of it, and I go, oh, "Check it out." And then she was like, "Wow, I had no idea what you were going to write." Now I did call my brother in New York because he's a musician as well. 
Okay. He's a, a fabulous bass player. And he's an amazing singer, but he won't sing in front of people. I saw him <laughs> sing at church one time, and I just I wept. His voice was that. <laughs> hey, really? What's his name? And, What's um, his name? What's his name? Let's Austin get him a Finley. plug. Okay. Austin Finley. Yeah. He's All right. Amazing. And uh, and then he said, uh, I said, I'm writing a song about a lean to, and uh, just he goes, yeah, maybe you can make it. It means like, to, like the shelter of uh, uh, another person, or you know, a safe place to go. And uh, I kept it in my mind, mm-hmm. and somehow we got it in there, and it, and it, and uh, on another note. It, this is the first song that April is a co-writer with me on. Uh, she wrote a, a, a line in the song in the second verse that I think adds so much to the song. It just it is you couldn't have asked for a better line to be written. And um, <laughs> all right. And the recording's coming out great. And so it's the story of our life right now. Uh, we're a couple of people that she struggled with music. I struggled in life because I love music so much. So I never had that normal life. I never had the home and you know, I could have, but I, right. I, I guess I, I never made it work. I was never very good at relationships until now. Now I, I'm good at it. Excellent. I have a good one. But this Lean To song is, is basically the dream of getting that home and building a barn with a Lean To. How we both want it and are putting our dreams together. And instead of putting a picture board on the wall to go after what we want in life, I suggested why don't we write songs about the things we want in life and nice. do it that way and so this right. is, lean to was the first song at that yeah all right so let's uh, the audience is dying to hear the song right now i can feel it so let's listen to lean to and we'll be back with walter and april right after the song stick with us everybody check this out Piece of land and build a little barn with a lean to. We were talking last night about the things I like. She said, Me too. A little river out back, we can run and hide. Or go fishing. She's like a garden on the other side of that barn with a lean to. Yeah, me too. Dogs in the yard don't know what fences are, lots of trees too. A gray gravel road travels down around a home that needs to. Well, the swimming hole where the wild things grow, like blackberries. She'd like a garden on the other side of that barn with a lean to. Yeah, me too.
got to lean to We were talking last night about the things I like She said me too Hey, we're back. Hey, that song Lean To is, is really great. Thanks for sharing that with us. Hey, Walter, we were talking early, earlier about, and it seems to be a point of conversation here in New York about all my friends who are starting to say, you know what, uh, I'm thinking of leaving New York and uh, finding a, a better life, whether it's in North Carolina, Florida, or what have you. So tell me about um, that journey that you took, because I find it, it, that was a big leap, I would think. And how did that come about? Not only was I a troubadour in music at the time before I left New York, I was also a, a troubadour in life. You know, I, I lived mm. alone and I spent a lot of time alone. And I, I would literally sing at night. You get home by one or two in the morning, mm. fall asleep by three or four. You know, I would wake up by 10 o'clock. I would work out and then I'd have my uh, recording equipment and work on music eat, work out, make music, and then get ready to run out and do another show. And that was my life. After wow. a while, that got a little mundane. But sure. I did uh, have a lucky moment when uh, I was approached at a show I was doing, and the owner walked up behind me and said, you know, I would like to help you out. Is there anything I can do for you? And mm-hmm. at that time, I had just met with, um, and you remember Chris Marshak, right? Oh, sure. Great uh, guy. I reached out to Chris to record some songs. I'm like, I heard you can record people's music. Would you want to produce music for me? And he had showed up at a uh, another uh, gig I was doing out in Riverhead. And he just walked in. And I was in the middle of a playing. He go, hey, can I play with you? I'm like, yeah, sure. He brought out his percussions and started playing. Wow. And I started, I said, let me show you the songs I want to record. So I played them. And then uh, as I'm playing, we stopped the song. He goes, hey, Walter, can we take a break right now? And I said, yeah, sure. He goes, I'd like to talk to you outside. And he took me outside. And you know Chris's mannerisms. He's just so calm and cool. And Agreed, yeah. It's wonderful. And he goes, I know you want me to record your songs. And he played me some music in his car. And he said, uh, this is a friend of mine I work with. His name's Ben Wish. I think we should reach out to him to record your music. So I did. The okay. problem was it, I couldn't afford it. Okay. So we had this wonderful producer. He's well known. He's done a lot of great work. And then within a week, this man comes up behind me and says, I'd love to help you out. Really? What can I do? Yeah. And I said, well, it's funny because I wanted to make this record, but I can't afford it. He goes, well, I have the money. Come by tomorrow and pick it up and make that record. And that's how that started happening. Yeah. So we made this beautiful record. And it was, like I said earlier, it was something I wrote, of like a healing album, I guess. Okay. uh, Very heartfelt. It wasn't a pop record or anything that would be noted for awards or anything like that right Mm -hmm. Uh, so i give it to the man who paid for it and he called me into his office to come meet with him and i went to meet him and he said this is beautiful we love it and he knew people in the industry and he knew people that owned all the radio stations and he said but we want you to play country music you need to write country songs and that's how the meeting ended so shortly after that yeah i mean i was kind of burnt out living alone, and I had nothing to lose, so I moved to South mm-hmm. Carolina. I wanted to get immersed wow. in that country way of life and write country music because I didn't want to just listen to music on the radio and write what I heard. I don't believe right. in that. I won't even listen to the radio in my car because I don't want to write what I just heard. I want to hmm. create original art if I can, you know, just to be me in my songs. Sure. And... Somebody had led me to Columbia and said, yeah, there's a lot of work there. You'll love it. And I didn't like it at all. It was no work, and it was very really hard. And luck had, had it that a friend had a friend that just bought a hotel in Myrtle Beach. Okay. And he, he hired me to live in his hotel and play there every day uh, in Myrtle wow. Beach. Yeah, and it was it was great. You know, it was cool. I played the beach bum. I was the dressed boho. I had the long hair and... And then while I was there, I met somebody that was connected to or somehow related to the Marshall Tucker Band. And they said, you belong in Lake Norman, which is really? uh, just like it's almost like being in Long Island when you go to Lake Norman. It's okay. a big lake. It's probably the si- uh, as much shore, shore front. It, it's I almost guess, the same exact square foot as, as Long Island, I think. It's, it's a oh, big wow. lake. Yeah. So I... I called a friend in, in New York, and he said, my brother just moved to Lake Norman. And then the next day he goes, my brother got you a gig. 
so I, I drove there. It was t- an hour and a half to two hours from where I was living. And I ended up working four or five nights a week there almost immediately. You know, and I left wow. the Myrtle Beach. And, and then I would drive in two, I'd say two hours with traffic there and two hours back every day. It was killing me in my car. So I moved to Lake Norman. Uh, but I did meet a country writer who was active in the industry. He took a liking to my record and he was trying to coach me into writing mm-hmm. more commercial uh, country music. And then lo and behold, I met Miss April. And when April came into my world, I started really learning the what the Southern country uh, existence is really all about. And living down in the South, you really get to see the camaraderie between everybody because everybody... Their mothers, their grandmothers, their great-grandmothers and grandfathers all play banjos, guitars, or some kind of instrument, and it's Mm. just a thing. So it's not like people are showboating around like other cities you might go to. It's just what we do. It's just... And I I finally... I found that family music tie. Uh, We went to visit her brother, who's an amazing musician, and her cousin was there, and she was there. And a short while after being there... They sat down and started singing three-part harmonies for a while and singing all the old country. And it was something to behold. It was really cool. Hey, Marty. It was really a good thing. <laughs> so, um... It sounds, it sounds like so you met the Carter family reimagined, you know? In a way. And, and she's got yeah. stories about that she can tell you. But oh, please. So, I love to play freestyle. I'm just a, you know, I don't like to rehearse. I'm like, I like that spur of moment. And I'm used to playing with amazing musicians that can just fly off the cuff and make amazing right. music progressive jazz rock blues <clears throat> and april would um listen to me and i'd try to cover a country song which that's not that's not how it goes that's that's not the right way to play it <laughs> and i'd be like i don't care i'm playing it my way but you know i started learning and she goes this is how mama used to do it you know and she'd show me the riff and this is how mama would play this riff and this is how mama would do it one fear that i had honestly when we first met right his experience in jazz well just I'm not if, a, if a we're being candid musician. and honest you yeah, know, sure. when you're flying by the seat of your britches and you don't know what chord they're going to next you just fall right in right well i was taught that you know, you play it by the book. And as long as you play it by the book and then you can add a couple of things here and there to make it your own, then sure. that's that's just how I was raised. Yeah, that's that how I was sense. taught. Yeah. And so when he comes in playing all these uh, F major W chords and t- <laughs> tying his fingers in knots and you w can't chords. tell where the hell he's going next, you're like, that chord is not in that song. Stop. What are you doing? Change, I changed the flavor. <laughs> because... Down here, I was raised that if you disrespect the music, you won't be uh, welcomed anywhere to play it. Oh, so interesting. It was hard for me to understand because Freedom. there there was no culture. And you, the only culture I grew up with, on a farm with a garden, we had FHA, FFA, right. Future Farmers of America. We we yeah. sang in chorus. You know, so there was no culture. There was no Italian. No, we had Mexican pizzas. I mean, you know, there was no culture. I, I understand right. now why why it was like that because you had to go play with neighbors and visit people and you better play it the same way yeah. so you could play along with others, I guess. I mean, if it's a one I never five, played well with others. If That's it's, the problem. Yeah, if it's a one four five <laughs> using the Nashville number system and G C and D, if it's a one four five and one is G, then you got C and D. <clears throat> if everybody knows where you're going, you can all play together. But if <laughs> right. you're all playing a different song, it sounds like you're murdering a cat. No, you're making me sound bad now. It wasn't like that at all. So I had to learn no, I, his ad lib I put some color and in, see where it fit in. I put color in chords because I play usually alone. So if you're just strumming GCD all night long, it is monotonous and boring. And ugh. But if you add six and nines and majors and minors and color the chords up when you're a solo artist, it becomes beautiful and interesting. That's how I look at it. This brings us to the end of part one of our conversation with Walter Finley and April Dawn. There's so much more to discover on their background and their music. Check out part two with Walter Finley and April Dawn. And thanks for joining us. Please remember to share and comment on the show to help spread the great word of what we're doing here on the Long Island Sound. Thank you for joining us today. I appreciate the time you spent with us. 
please subscribe and comment and visit us at gigdestiny.com. Till next time, be generous with your joy, keep your spirits high, and let the music take you on a journey. Be well. Peace. Peace.